whilst many of the subjects we're going to talk about or, or the examples I give you are going to be specific around coaching, essentially you can take these skills and you can use them in any business, in any area. I think it's fair to say that during this time, a lot of people, and, and certainly a lot of people have asked me, but a lot of people are, are struggling to get in clients. When we come out the other side of this, business is going to change. Business is not going to be done in the same way that it was you know, uh, previously. Yes, there's going to be certain things that, that will go back to normal, but I think the business landscape is changing a lot and becoming more familiar with things like Zoom and other ways of doing things is going to be imperative for us as coaches, but actually for you know, any business that we are going to do. So you've got your, your workbook. The workbook really is just about, uh, is just for the exercises. I'll go through the, the presentation or the PowerPoint over here. Like I said, if you've got any questions, go ahead, unmute yourself, and then you can just ask, uh, ask a question. When I first thought about this, I thought, okay, well, let's look at seven ways to actually increase your visibility and your profits. The idea is that, firstly, we're not going to make any profits if nobody's going to find us, right? And the thing is, we can increase our visibility as well, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we increase our profits. So these actually are two separate things, yet they do lead on to each other as well. So what are some of the things that we can look at doing? Well, of course, we've got live training. We've got workshops. We're going to talk about one-to-one -one coaching, which is probably where most people on this call today uh, would be approaching this workshop from, right? Uh, we'll talk about group coaching, masterminds, online courses, uh, membership site. And as a bonus, I'm going to throw in their webinars, and there's actually a couple of others as well. In fact, there's so many different ways and how you can increase your profitability and your visibility. But if we just look at these, uh, these sort of seven or eight between today and tomorrow. Now, you might say to me, Wayne, but hell, you know, I, I'm looking at doing coaching or one-to-one -one coaching. Why should I be doing live training? Why should I be doing workshops? That's not my stuff. Masterminds aren't my thing. You know, how do I do a membership site? Like I said, business is changing. And who here at the moment has so many one-to-one -one clients that they absolutely cannot deal with them? Or who at the moment is making so much money through their one-to-one -one coaching that everything is just absolute bliss and it couldn't be any better? I think the fact that you're on this workshop already suggests that there is room for improvement. There's more, and, and I'm, you know, I, I use the word money here, and as you all know, I'm not money driven. But at the end of the day, we still need to put bread and butter on the table. And if we want to serve other people, if we want to be there as coaches to coach our clients, then we've got to be able to be financially able to do that. So money is important, profits is important. Even a charity or not-for-profit not organization still needs to make a profit to be able to serve their clientele. Zig Ziglar said, you cannot make it as a wandering generality. You must become a meaningful specific. Just think about that. You cannot make it as a wandering generality. You must become a meaningful specific. Think about your niche, about the types of clients that you want to be working with. If we want to be everything to everybody, then it's very difficult to actually market that, right? People want to know that people are looking not for coaching. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, hey, you know what? I feel like getting a coach. People wake up and they say, I've got a problem with my weight. I've got a problem with motivation. I 
have a problem in my business and I need to learn how to reduce my expenses or make more profits or I need help in marketing my business. So people wake up for a very specific reason, not to say, I want a coach. So if you can become a meaningful specific, become very clear what is your offering and who is your ideal client you've got or certainly most of you should have let me know if you don't because i will forward that to you again but you should all have your uh, create your signature program and i'm going to talk about that a little later again so the point is that we want to start with creating our intellectual property whether that is a training program like i said online offline, whether it's a workshop, whether it's uh, your one-to-one -one coaching, group coaching, your intellectual property is your stuff. It's what you are going to be known for. And if you can create your intellectual property, if you can be clear on everything that you're offering, actually all the rest follow from this. I think it's fair to say that a lot of people are so scared of failure. And as Dennis Waitley said, he said, failure should be our teacher, not our undertaker. Yeah, failure is delay, not defeat. It's a temporary detour, not a dead end. So failure is something that we can only avoid if we say nothing, if we do nothing, and we be nothing. We all fail from time to time. However, remember, is the presupposition of NLP, it's not failure, it's only feedback. We want to fail forwards. Think about that person who's running the hurdles. If you drop over every single hurdle, you're still going to get to the finish line, so failing forwards. So let's talk about live training for a moment. Most of you probably don't have any live training Sam, I think if I remember correctly, you know, you, you've got live training courses that you offer. One or two others of you might have. But typically speaking, when we think from a coaching point of view, we're not doing any live training, right? We are essentially trading time for money or hours for dollars. You come and see me, Mr. Client, and I'm going to charge you 200 pounds an hour. And once that relationship is done, it's, it's kind of done. And I'm on this hamster wheel of continually trying to get new clients. When we do live training, well, why would I want to do live training? Live training, on the one hand, first of all, it generates you a lot more income, but it's actually something that leads on to other resources as well or, or other offerings that you might have. In fact, if you Think back, what did we say? We're going to talk about live training. We're going to talk about workshops, one-to-one -one coaching, group coaching, masterminds, online courses, membership sites, webinars. All of these things can actually interconnect. So if I can do a live training, be very specific in my niche and where I'm going to work, right? So let, let me use my business as an example. If I'm doing the life coach course or the NLP training, that's one part of the business in of itself. However, very often I get people that then come to me and say, you know what, thank you, that, that's great, but I need coaching as well. I need somebody to hold my hand to help me through this process. The, the content, the course is great, but I need more help. So by offering a course, you can potentially lead into other business as well. Again, this whole idea with, with uh, creating your live training is about becoming clear on your intellectual property. So just bear with me as we go through this, right? Again, some of you have already done the trainer's training. Some of you have already done the how to create online courses. So some of these things might uh, jump out at you and you might remember them. What skill set do you have, right? What, instead of being this wandering generality, how can we become a meaningful specific? What specific skill set do you have? What specific knowledge do you have 
that you want to help your client with. If I'm going to be a weight loss coach, then hopefully I've got some experience within that. In fact, if I use Tom as the example, Tom is, is set up a, a coaching business specifically helping people going through divorce. Very specific, right? He's been able to take his knowledge and essentially create a program which he can then take to divorce attorneys, etc. And that's my point. What knowledge do you have? What is your field of expertise that you can go and become that niche coach? Right now, not only is it within your coaching, but like I said, you can actually create a program from it where you can teach other people. You know, do you already have any courses that you offer? If you do have, great. We're going to come back to those and, and we'll see how can we actually uh, utilize them. If you don't have any courses, how can we go and create a course? You know, what do people ask you advice on? Why do they come to you for coaching? If I'm going to be a business coach and a lot of my clients come to me and they, let's say I was working with startup businesses and the clients come to me and they say, you know what, they've got a problem with getting finance from the bank at the moment, going through the, the current situation, they've got problems with getting finance. Well, then I might set up a mini course specifically on how can they create a business plan and how can they put together the application form for getting government funding, right? So the course doesn't have to be a seven day course. It doesn't have to be a seven day training. If I've got a number of clients that have the same problem, well, then I've got to ask myself, maybe there are lots of other people that are having the same problems. So if I can create a little course and I make that available just to business owners who specifically are having that problem, one, they're coming to me for the training. And like I said before, then they might say, hey, you know what? Okay, that's great. But now can we also do coaching? Because now that I get to know, like, and trust you, now that I have an idea about what it is specifically that you can help me with, now that leads into the coaching application. Okay, so have you ever created any content to help people solve their problems? What are your professional or personal experiences? What can people learn from? If I use Tom as the example again, talking about uh, divorce coaching, you know, having gone through that process is a great teacher. And so being able to take that experience that it can then help other people to go through that process themselves. So on page two in your workbook there, you know, everybody's going to start somewhere, right? But think about this for yourself. Now, we're not going to spend time doing each of these during the training because we just don't have enough time to do that. But go away and please do these exercises because they are going to help you. And whilst, like I said before, you know, whilst you might think in the beginning, hey, well, I don't really want to do these live trainings. I don't see how that's going to benefit me. I promise you that, and, and you don't have to do all of these seven or eight things we're going to be talking about. See what works best for you. But I promise you the more of them you can do, they integrate, they work together, and they will actually lead to more visibility and profits for you. Okay, so go and ask yourself, page two there says, what training experience do you have? Okay. And how can you use that experience? How can you start to create your own course? Are people interested in your industry or profession? Now, people are interested in coaching, but they, they're not interested in coaching itself. They're interested in losing weight. They're interested in increasing their profits. Does that make sense? Yeah, just give me a, a one in the chat box here if this makes sense to you guys. Yeah, ask yourself, what are you most passionate about? And we can change that word teaching to coaching, right? Uh, what are you most passionate about 
coaching your clients? And what can you teach them? What's the most urgent need that your ideal participant has? And then align your business and your brand with that, right? Align with your values, align with your goals. So essentially, you want to fill this void that's there. If your client, I can use the example of uh, getting a, a business plan, many uh, new businesses or, or startup businesses, as we know, actually fail within the first two years. Why? Because, well, for one, they probably don't have a great business plan. Most of them fail because they don't have cash flow. Sometimes businesses, they, you know, they've got these great contracts. They might even be doing business with multinational companies, but they still go bankrupt and the business still goes out of business because they didn't have cash flow to be able to see them through. You know, they might be, they, their clients might be operating on a 90 or 120 day payment terms and the small business owner can't handle that. They don't have enough cash flow to help them through those three, four, five months before they get paid again. All right. So I had one particular lady as a client. Uh, her turnover was, I think it was uh, off the top of my head now, 70, 80 million, something like that. And uh, she'd been doing work with government. And of course, she wasn't working on, uh, on high profit margins, but government had owed her and this was about 11 months later. Government still owed her near enough a million. Now, what that means is that she's paid her staff. She's paid her, uh, the people that she got product from, right? But her profits, that million pounds or that million rand that, uh, that the government still owed her, that comes directly out of the net profits. So if you've got companies that uh, you know, have this type of issue or, or have, they go out of business because they don't have cash flow, well, there is a huge training opportunity, right? If, as a business coach, I can put together a training specifically around setting up their business plan and how they should be making sure that they've got cash flow, et cetera, right? So what type of training could I put together for them? Like I said before, the aim of that is so that afterwards they say, you know what, that's great information. Now, how can I take you on as a coach? You know, what's something that you're passionate about teaching or, or maybe even something that you take for granted? You think, ah, oh, th this is so easy. I mean, uh, not me, but let's say, I've got a, uh, I, I'm healthy, I've got a six pack, you know, I've got, uh, I can run 20 kilometers, no problem. I don't understand how not everybody in the world is super fit, right? So that's something that maybe you take for granted. But think about all the other people that might be struggling with those issues. So there might be a learning opportunity or training opportunity, something that you can share with them. Yeah. What makes you uniquely qualified to teach that topic? What are the experiences? All of those questions that we looked at before. Teach something that, that sets you on fire, that brings joy to your life. What's a current and urgent problem that you can solve for your ideal client? Again, we're just taking the coaching hat off for a moment, right? This is purely about training. Who's really interested in your training? I bet there are loads of startup businesses. I mean, do you know anybody who during this time period maybe has lost their job? I know a few people. I've got people that have canceled the upcoming courses with me because they've lost their jobs. So a lot of people will, if, once they've, if they've lost their job, maybe they want to start their own business. Or maybe there's people that have had their businesses, which the business has gone under, and now they're going to be looking at doing something else. So there might be two groups of people that have very specific training needs. 
you know, how to set up a business or how to make sure that the following business is going to be prosperous and profitable. Ask people, what is it that they are wanting? What do they need? And of course, we can do this in many different ways. Ask yourself, what's the current coaching world not helping your clients with? What is archaic? What, maybe there's an old way of doing things and we've moved on. What are the missing pieces? My daughter said to me uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, we're having our, uh, our walk and she said, can she become a personal trainer? I said, well, first of all, it, it, it's not up to me what you become, right? If you want to become a personal trainer, then there's a lot of personal trainers that don't make it. There's a lot of personal trainers that live below the breadline. Then there are some personal trainers who do very, very well. So what are the missing pieces? What makes one personal trainer profitable versus another personal trainer who's not? What are some of the additional things that you might want to offer? So maybe, yes, I'm to be a personal trainer, but maybe it's really important to uh, be a dietitian as well. Maybe it's important to consider who am I doing the personal training through? So rather than going to Virgin Active and putting my services up there on the, on the billboard and saying, okay, I'm going to charge 50 pounds for the hours of personal training. You know, what's missing? What about, there's probably a lot of people that go to the gym. They'd love to have a personal trainer, but they don't want to be trained in front of everybody else. Maybe they're embarrassed. So there's a missing piece. Maybe there's a type of clientele where there needs to be a very specific area where you're going to train them. Maybe it's off-site. Again, I, I don't know, right? But that's my question. What are the missing pieces? What are the things that other people are not currently offering them? Now, what are your ideal clients looking for compared to what's on the market? And what can you then add to your course to better serve them? If I look at the NLP training as an example, you know, here in the UK, we've got, I think, 450 NLP trainers. There's, there's certainly more people that have become trainers, but how do you stand out? You know, what, how can I better serve my clients? I can teach about NLP. You can learn NLP from many different people. But what do you do to make it better? Example, add the life coaching, add the timeline therapy, add the online resources that you can go and learn by yourself afterwards, after service. Now you've, you've heard the term after sales service and how often that falls flat on its face. I pride myself on being able to give that after sale service, being there for my people. So what can you do to better serve your audience? Question also is, what are they prepared to pay for and how much are they prepared to pay? It's very, very easy for you as a coach to be busy every single day doing loads of free coaching, but not making any money. I recently put a, uh, a little talk box onto my, uh, onto my website. So when people go on there, they can send me a message directly from the website and I can speak to them live without needing to go through email or anything else. And you'll be surprised how many people ask, okay, well, will they be certified for the, for the, free training, right? For the introduction training. And then I say, no. They say, okay, well, to get certified, what must they do? And I say, well, the live seven day training. They say, well, is that free? And I go, no. And then they'll just hang up and they'll, you know, they'll, they'll move on. They, they don't want to uh, speak anymore. So you, there's going to be certain clients that just are not your clients. Okay. Or there's going to be certain ideas which might seem like good ideas to us, but they're not really what people are looking for. Okay, so what is your ideal? Who's your ideal client? What are they prepared to pay? And how much are they prepared to pay? And does that work for you? 
Give me a one there if this got, still makes sense to you guys. Are you still with me? Okay, good, good. Like I said, this should be in alignment with your business and your brand. I don't know if you've ever heard the saying, we certainly said in the, in the army as well, you know, you don't trust the skinny cook because maybe they don't like their own food. If you are, that doesn't mean that our life as a life coach doesn't mean your life is perfect, right? We all have stuff that happens and that's okay. But what's not okay is if we are portraying a certain, we, we giving a certain message and then we're doing totally the opposite. What do you want to be known for? Be a meaningful specific. So what do you want to be known for? You, so you be the guru in your field, in that piece of expertise that you have. What level of client do you want to work with? This, I think, relates to many different areas, right? Do you want to work with children? Do you want to work with adults? Do you want to work with uh, ladies? Do you want to work with men? Do you want to do a entry level course? You know, let's say I was doing a course on Excel. Is it a, a course just learning how to double click on the Excel icon and Excel to open up? Or is it a course actually teaching people how to import information into Excel? Right, so what level and what type of client do you want to work with? What income do you want to make? And what income bracket do you want to target to make that goal a reality? This comes to our coaching as well. Every training I ask, I say, how much do you want to earn from your coaching? How many hours do you want to work? And how much do you want to charge per hour? And often there's such a disconnect between what people think they can charge, how much they want to charge, and how many hours they want to work. You know, if I wanted to, let's say uh, the person said that they want to charge 50 pounds per hour, they want to work 20 hours per week, right? So that's a thousand pounds per week, but they said they want to earn 10,000 pounds per month, that's a disconnect. So I think we have to become and be realistic. That, however, doesn't mean that on the one hand, I can go and charge 10,000 pounds for one coaching session. Yeah, that, that's possible. But who are you targeting? You're probably not targeting a client who has no job, who lives on state means. Okay, so it's about targeting the right client that doesn't mean that you have to charge everybody either. You know, if you want to do some things and be charitable, that's okay. Just see how does everything fit within your overall goal. So create a course that enhances your business, enhances your brand, as I said. Again, on page three and four, there's some questions that you can do inside your uh, workbook there. So who's your audience? Now, like I said, be clear about your target market. How can you best serve your client group? Where's your specific skill set? Who do you like to work with? Now, consider how you can position your program alongside your other products. Like I said, each of these subjects we're going to talk about, they actually will work together. Who at the moment is thinking to themselves, I can never do a live training, or I don't want to do a live training. For who is that applicable to at the moment? So Prabhashni said, you know, I've just delivered a four-day live training in the private Facebook group. It was free. My problem is to start converting and attaching a value to these kinds of trading. You are absolutely right, Prabhashni. We can give so much stuff away, but this is again about finding your ideal clients. I love to give additional. I love to, to over deliver, right? Uh, by the way, if you guys haven't yet, because it's just to make sure you actually get all these things. If you haven't yet, please go and join the Facebook group. You might already have liked my Facebook page, 
but actually join the Coaching with NLP Facebook group because that way, whenever I post stuff on there, it definitely comes up on your timeline. Okay, why is that important? Well, recently I wrote an ebook specifically on how to use LinkedIn. So to start with LinkedIn and uh, to start doing marketing on LinkedIn. I then did one on YouTube. Uh, I'm in the process of doing one for Instagram. And, you know, these are just ebooks, they're 30, 35 pages, whatever they might be. As you know, I've, I've done a number of other ebooks and they all free stuff. So these are things that we can use to get clients or to start building trust and rapport with our clients. But then there comes a time where we've got to learn to actually monetize it. And professionally, that's something we'll, we'll talk about later, right? So Claudia, you ask which subject. It doesn't matter what the subject is. What sits with your brand? Claudia, if I remember correctly, please let me know. Uh, you had a business where you were doing yoga. Was that right? That's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So as a yoga teacher, there might be certain things that you can, you know, you, you're already delivering classes. Okay. By the way, all of these things we're talking about today and tomorrow can be used in other businesses as well. It's not just for coaching. So there you are as a yoga teacher. There's probably so many questions that people ask you. Uh, I, I don't know, right? I, I don't do yoga and that. It's something I'd like to do. But there's lots of information that you have that you don't share through your, your normal yoga class, right? And probably lots of types of questions that people would like to know. There's also, of course, for you to have become a yoga instructor or a yoga teacher, you've had to go through a learning process. So consider that. What information do you have that you can give over and above to your clients? Where they will pay you to come and learn from you. And in doing that, as I said earlier, it then also leads into other potential business opportunities, i.e. where they then come for private sessions or, uh, you know, come for group coaching or one-to-one -one coaching, etc. So the idea here is that your ideal participant should also be your, your ideal client. So they're going to take action. Think of that they graduate your course and they become either your one-to-one -one client or your VIP group or they join your mastermind or something to that effect. So you're essentially being able to upsell them into some of the other products. And you may have heard these terms before, right? You want to upsell, downsell, cross-sell, order bump. And we'll talk about some of these terms. But if your client is coming to you, they've, they've done your course, they've really built a know, like, and trust with you, then you can upsell them, like I said, to your VIP group or to your mastermind groups. Does that make sense to everybody? Give us a yes. Like I said, you want to go ahead and test your market as well. So make sure you're fishing in the right pond. And there's a few ways you can research your market. One example is go and join webinars. Go attend the right webinars, of course. So attend webinars of other thought leaders in that industry. And check, you know, in the comments boxes, see what are some of the complaints that some of the people have within that group? What are some of the wishes that they express? Go and read blogs, read uh, uh, forums, etc. You can check out teaching sites like Udemy or lynda.com. And there's so many of them nowadays as well. See what types of courses people are actually creating. Now, I know these are some of the online ones, but of course, you can also see what live trainings are, are being delivered. So one of the courses I'm considering creating at the moment is actually a public speaking course. And well, do people really want to learn how to do public speaking? I would say yes, right? And there's a huge opportunity, and we're not talking about that during these two days, but there's a huge opportunity to use public speaking to grow your coaching business as well. So why do I bring that up? Well, go and see what other people are delivering. 
what types, essentially, if you've done the, the NLP master prac with me, we've spoken about modeling. Now, modeling is not copying, right? You want to model. Notice what other people are doing. What are they doing that's good that you can implement? What are they doing that's rubbish that you can drop? What are they, maybe some people are going to say one thing and other people are going to say something else and it's going to be a one thing versus the other. What's your opinion on that? So you want to see what else is going on in the marketplace. Search for popular topics in your field. Uh, check out sites like Vimeo or YouTube. You know, there's so many videos on YouTube of all sorts of things. Now, most of them are really just about getting your attention. Uh, we'll actually, we can talk about YouTube as another way of making money, which I didn't even add on yet. But there's so many videos that are available Although probably most of them are not going to be an entire course, right? There's no, dare I say, certification at the end of looking at Vimeo or YouTube. But see what are other people doing. And again, like I said, what's rubbish? What's good? What can you make your own? What can you duplicate? Yeah. Create a few buyer avatars. Page five in your manual is looking at your avatar, right? Who specifically do you want to deal with? Now, if you remember watching the movie Avatar, yeah, who exactly is your client? You know, you want to become so specific. Example, let's say, uh, again, I was doing training for these startup businesses and I say my ideal client is a 30 to 40 year old male who has been in business for at least five years, failed at the first one, and now wants to succeed at, or he's failed at least once before, and now he wants to succeed at his next business. You might say, Wayne, yes, but that's so specific. Yeah, get very specific. Because when you're specific about your client, then you, know, you should be able to tell their story. You should be able to say this, you know, John, and you might even have a picture up of John, right? John is 30 years old. He's had two failed companies. He's uh, looking at setting up a new business. And, you know, he's now ready to take whatever action he's to take. But so that I can go and market to that very specific client. So like I said, look at what, what are some of the complaints? What are some of the wishes that they have? And... Uh, just go and complete those pages on page four and five. By the way, everybody, I'm sure you have already done your signature program. Adlin, yes. Yeah, anybody else? Give us a one in the text box there. Bobby, not all. Yeah, Prabhashni, yes. Crystal, yeah, you want to get on that. Brayton, yes. Sapfu, not yet. Not completely. No, I haven't done it. No, no. Also, if you guys don't have your signature program workbook, let me know. Pop me an email separately and I'll reply and I will add it on there for you again. Uh, again, I'm going to talk about the signature program uh, later, but it really helps you again to become very specific and clear in your ideal client. Now, whilst that is more geared towards the coaching, it actually relates very well to uh, even your, uh, you know, your, your live trainings and online trainings for that matter. Okay. So if you are going to do a training, you know, analyze the required level of your students needs. So what do they need? Understand what do they need from your training? So what are their needs as a whole, but what do they also need from your training? What background information do they have? Maybe you've got to start from scratch. Are you doing an introductory or are you doing the masters? Be clear on the role of the business or the department for who you're providing training. So if you're doing training for organization and uh, let's say I'm, let's say that I was doing this entrepreneurial training for a university and the finance department, well, it's not really important what they want, right? 
But what is important or which department would be important in the university is going to be the education department, right? Or, or the, who writes the syllabus? Who is responsible for the certifications that they're going to get? So that department is going to have certain requirements of what your training should be incorporating. You, gotta, uh, you can't please everybody all the, all the time. You know, make sure you please the right people. Okay, what are your learner characteristics? Understand who is your learner. Also, are there time constraints, budget constraints? As I said, people, sometimes they come on the website and they say, oh, they want to do the practitioner training for free. Well, they, they have a requirement. They need something that's low cost or uh, it might be that they're not able to take time off work to be at the live training at a certain time. Well, those are constraints. So what other options do I have for that? In this case, you know, it might be the online training. Then draft your course outline. You want to know what you create your course title. Your title is important because that's what people are looking for. What's the purpose of your course? Is it just to create an introduction? Or again, is it to give them a certification? What are the objectives? What are the outcomes that they're going to get? How are you going to train them? Is it going to be video? Is it going to be PDFs? Is it going to be live workshops, etc.? Okay, like I said, who's the intended audience? Consider the venues and the times. In South Africa, very often we use guest houses. In Ireland, I use a guest house, but most of the other venues around the UK and in Europe are typically hotels. So consider why you use the different venues. If I'm doing a training in Portugal, as an example, uh, then doing one near a mainline train station is very important. Whereas in London, it's important at least to be at a major tube intersection. Dietary information. If you do offer food at your live trainings, Consider what, what's necessary from people from a dietary point of view. Do people need halal food? Do they need vegetarian food? Logistical arrangements, duration and training schedule. Who is delivering the training? Are you delivering the training yourself? Or have you got other people that are subcontracting to you? Have a list of all your resource materials. So are you using books? Are you using manuals? Are you using videos? Again, and understand when you're going to use which one. And also, do you offer certification? Now, this training that we're talking about so far today is, is not about offering certification. It's about getting your clients into a room. And by the way, it can be live or it can be done, you know, something like this via Zoom. But it's about getting them into a room sharing information with them that's going to help them, that they can walk away with actionable information and ideally, like I said, lead into something else as well, okay? Because they're building a relationship of no like and trust with you. So as you create your course content then, again, what, are you, what skills are they going to learn? What actions will they be able to complete? What knowledge will they master? Or at what level of competency will they have after completing your course? These are all important things because, of course, that's why they're coming to do your course, right? So you've got to be able to tell them up front what are the things that they're going to be walking away with. What's it going to allow them to do? So you want to write down your course objectives. You'll see again on page six, page seven, these are some of the things that we're talking about, right? As you write your lesson plan, what I like to do is to get a bunch of post-it notes and I decide, okay, what are going to be my different modules? And in each of those modules, and they can be different color post of notes. They can be the same ones. But what am I going to do in each one of these modules? Right? I might tell a metaphor. I might do exercises. What resources will I use? What scripts might I have? What checklists might be involved? 
So as you write your course, then start with your course outline. Review your learning resources. What is it that you need to deliver to your students or to your audience? What resources are they going to need? Determine each lesson's specific objections or sorry, objectives. Example, in the NLP training, you know, there's a section specifically around anchoring, specifically for parts integration. So what is the objective of every specific lesson? Determine the appropriate means of instruction or, or many of the techniques. You know, there's a time when we've got to do a demonstration and then also practical work. So how do we demonstrate or how do we instruct? It's not just about talking at people. They've got to see something. They've got to see a demonstration and they want to practice themselves as well. So design your activities that's going to complement your resources, your learning resources. And will your resources and your activity deliver? Is it going to work for your client? Silly example there might be, let's say I was working with uh, a group of students and they were blind and I gave them a printed manual. Well, that's not going to deliver. I would need to give them a manual that is in Braille, right? Or more of a audio rather than giving them a written word. I think it's very useful to visualize yourself successfully teaching. You might think, well, what's that got to do with writing a lesson plan? When we write the lesson plan, you've got to see yourself being able to deliver that. See yourself, for, for one, it's going to take away some of your fears and anxieties. But see yourself being able to deliver that almost like when you do perceptual positions, right? What are going to be some of the objections that might come up? What are some of the problems that might come up? So that as you visualize yourself successfully teaching that, you are able to be preemptive in what might come up so that you can actually answer those object objections or those questions before they even come up. Right? And notice whether you can actually do that. And if you can't, then the question might be, well, what do I need to do differently? Or what other resources would I need to be able to deliver that training then? Make sure you have a time schedule and that you stick to it. We've spoken about what's your outcome, you know, what resources and activities are you going to need, how many participants do you need, this is going to be true for live trainings and online courses, right? or even if you're doing workshops or online workshops. If you're going to charge, consider how many participants do you need and how much you're going, going to pay. At the end of the day, you know, there's a time and a place, and as Prabhashni said earlier, you know, it's about starting to monetize. If I'm doing it for free, then that's okay. Then know that I'm doing it for free. But if I've got to make a certain income from it, then I've got to say, okay, well, what's going to be my expenses? How much does it cost me to operate Zoom? How much does it cost me to hire a room if that was going to be the case? Okay, and how much do I then need to charge each of the participants so I know what type of money I can walk away with? And when is it a break even? Or when is it better just to say, you know what? Actually, we can't do this anymore. Because if you're going to deliver a training and it's costing your money and, and, and that's in the background of your mind while you're trying to deliver the training, that's going to negatively affect your delivery. So what do you want people to leave with and how will they know that they have it? What do the trainees want to leave with? Okay, so what you might want them to leave with and what they want to leave with might be two different things. I would suggest they should be closely married, but they might have a certain expectation of what they're going to walk away with, right? And so we've got to make sure that we deliver on that. Do they know each other? Whenever, let's say a husband and a wife come and do the training with me, then typically I will say to them that they're not allowed to work together during for many of the exercises, there's some that they can work together and some that they can't. Okay, if you have, let's say you're doing a, a, 
training in an organization and you're training for a couple of different departments, do the people know each other? Do they sit together? You know, does it become clicky? Does it become you against me, you know, or them against each other? Uh, if they know each other, do they sit next to each other and chat all the time? What are their ages and their backgrounds? I personally don't take students in under the age of 18 and ideally actually not really under 21. What specific needs do they have? Like I said, it could be dietary, it could be uh, you know, maybe they wheelchair access, etc. whatever the case might be. Do they want to be there or did the boss send them? Because that's going to have a big impact, right? What are the times and the days for the training? Do you do them on weekends? Do you do them in the morning? Do you do them in the afternoon? What's your purpose for specifically deciding on those times and those days? This, you know, we say, okay, do Monday and Tuesday. Why? Because it's the start of our week. We've had the weekend, given you time to do whatever you needed to do this morning so that you can you know, set some time aside to do this today and tomorrow. Usually not over the weekend because, you know, then maybe the family wants to, uh, you know, wants to have some of your time, especially during this time, right, where we're in lockdown and the family members are around the house and they want to do other things. What stories and metaphors might be useful? Metaphors are underused. Consider metaphors. You should be able to tell metaphors for every one of your lesson plans because it really helps to get the, the message across. Yeah. What concerns do you have? I've got to tell you guys, right? Half an hour before we started this, I was thinking to myself, actually, I said to my wife, you know, uh, I said, I'm feeling a little bit nervous coming to deliver this. And well, why was I feeling nervous? Well, I tell you why. I was feeling nervous because I want to make sure that these two days are really useful for you. You, you giving your time to be here. So I want to make sure that I'm not teaching you how to suck eggs. I want to make sure that it's valuable. At the same time, it's also the first time that I've done the workshop via Zoom. So is everything going to work right, etc.? And so it's fine to have concerns. That doesn't mean that you have to fear things. It just means that you acknowledge that there could be challenges, and that's okay. It's how do you deal with those challenges? So set your concerns aside, the ones that are, that are not legitimate, right? Your butterflies, whatever. Well, that's just energy. That just means, hey, you, you know, you're there. Uh, but don't get caught up in negative feelings and emotions, right? And then it paralyzes you. I think every training that you do, every day that you have during your, your course, you should have an agenda to follow. Because it's so, so easy. Either you start talking or people start asking questions or you start telling stories. It's very easy to overrun. It's also easy to run through things very quickly and then you think you did a great job but maybe your audience didn't get the information in the way that they needed to receive it so make sure that you've got the, the your times written down how much time you're going to use for each of the topics that you might be discussing does this make sense to you guys are you still there okay so let's just talk about some learning materials because there you are you know you're going to be delivering your training but what do you give? I think sometimes for people, one of the concerns is, okay, well, now I've got to write a manual. It certainly was for me, I'll tell you that. I love to give a manual for every training that we're doing. Why? Because it gives your audience a record of what was discussed during the training. It gives them something that they can walk away with. Now, again, during the NLP training, I like to give the manual as a color printed manual but on nice thick paper, something that when they walk away, they, they can remember you by, right? Rather than just a 80 gram printed piece of paper that you did at home quickly. Provide illustrations or steps for the procedures. Yeah, this is going to help people, especially your visual people. It's also and your ADs to help them take step by step. Summarize key points of your presentation. Yeah, your 
Learning materials keep participants engaged through activities and reading. Just be aware that you don't have so much reading for them to do that they actually get caught up and they're not actually paying attention to what you're delivering. And also it's useful for them to re-access the information in the future. All right, so if you're going to create your own, ask yourself, why are you using that particular resource? Are you using books? Are you using values? Why? Is there time for that resource? Uh, for some of you, you've seen the, the video that I do sometimes during Prack and Master Prack, the Stop It video. And uh, no, I don't always do that. But is there time to do it? They can be very useful as well for filling up time. Okay, what purpose will it serve? Well, the stop it video, you've heard me a few times during the training. Somebody will say something, I'll just say stop it. And so why, why use the video then? Because it helps to make it a little bit more lighthearted and people really get into the idea then, well, I've got to stop doing these things inside of my head. Are the existing materials working for you? If they are, great. If they're not, well, how can you change them? What type of learning material is needed? What will your learning materials provide? Okay. Is it instruction? Is it an overview? Consider the types of materials you could use and when. Make the material easy to understand. Organize your material so it facilitates learning. You want to, for as best as possible, have things follow on and flow. It's not always possible. And, you know, sometimes you just got to do the best that you can. But for as much as possible, have it to flow. Make it easy to read. So don't write it in size 10. You know, have it written in size 14, 16, whatever. But a, a, a nice big size, easy to read, easy to understand. Not trying to put everything onto one page. And test your materials and ask for feedback. In fact, we'll talk about testing and doing beta testing tomorrow. Like I said, there are some exercises there from page six to eight. Page eight specifically, actually, is uh, deciding on your actual modules. Okay, so what's the module number? When might you use it? It might be a specific week. It might be a specific lecture. What's the outcome? Yeah. Maybe you've got a metaphor to tell etc etc anybody any questions you've got to stand out from the crowd you've got to become a meaningful specific this is true for our coaching it's true for everything we do promotion you said okay how do you monetize it how do you make money from it we want to consider what's the value that you're offering what's the value that you're offering versus your client's needs and your client's goals. And they've got a balance, right? Consider though that you want to increase value, not workload. Okay? So add more value. If I look at this, the NLP training, we've, we've got NLP and timeline and coaching within the seven days. I can't add more in those seven days, but what can I do? I can add value through the online courses. I can add value through free coaching sessions. I can add value in doing workshops, in eBooks, etc. Page nine and 10, again, gives you some, uh, some questions that you can go ahead and do. So what is your course promise? You know, what are you going to, to give your clients, your audience? What should they be able to do based on having done the training with you? What are you offering? What's unique? What are the benefits? Do you have one-to-one -one interaction? Maybe you've got some, some social proof, some stories that you can tell. Consider, are you charging? Are you charging full price? Do you offer discounts? Do you have early bird prices? Okay, how do they do payments? Can they do monthly payments? Can they do split payments? Are you giving them some additional things? Is it a tiered course? Do you give eBooks? What else might you be able to give them? 
You might have a special price just for subscribers. And of course, you need to start spreading the word. There's a distinct difference between marketing and sales, right? Marketing is about raising awareness. Sales is about people actually buying. You can market, 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 and people will take, 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 take. But if nobody is actually spending money with you, you've not made any sales. And if you are not converting, if you're not making some money, then you can't continually keep on giving. So market, use some free resources, that's great. But you've got to at some point in time turn around and say, okay, now I'm going to start charging. And I can't tell you what that needs to be or when that needs to be. But you've got to have a sales process. You've got to be able to ask for money on the other hand. And if you, if you feel bad about asking for money, then ask yourself, what are your money blocks? Remember that word sales. What does salesperson mean to you? Get rid of any negative emotions, limiting beliefs. Right, so you want to grow an active community. And we can do this in many ways. You know, Facebook is just one of them, of course. But engagement means consistent follow-up, especially through your email list. So have you got an email list at the moment? You know, who's got an email list? You ever say yes? You, you've got to be in the forefront of your clients' minds. You want to give them a reason to keep on coming back to you. If somebody comes to your website once, here's the thing about websites, and, and actually I'm going to ask you this question probably tomorrow. You know, have you already got your website? But you can have the most beautiful website. If nobody can find you, it's absolutely worthless. Then you might have a website and they find you. Now they've seen your website and they've, they've visited and they've walked away and you haven't been able to monetize it. So you've got to consistently think about how do we monetize everything that we do? You've got to make profits to be able to have a business, right? And to be able to serve more people. So what else can you do? Well, I can grow an active community by delighting my students, right? So what can I do? Do some events, do some web webinars, do this for your alumni. Uh, offers bonuses, you know, special offers. That's what this is, guys. It's, it's just a way of saying, hey, you know what? You guys spend money with me and I really want you to be successful. So what can I do to be able to help you to do that? Now, so many people had the option to actually be here today. Some could, some couldn't. Some had work to do. Other people, you know what? They just decided not to take up the opportunity. Or, that's okay. Some will, some won't. You do, you offer what you can and you will get engagement. You will find, you know, it, it's like I explained to Jade the other day as well. You're going to have suspects, prospects, clients, and raving fans. A suspect is somebody, they, they, they don't even know that they might need your solution, right? And then maybe they wake up one day and they say, yeah, you know, what? I do want a coach and they happen to find your website. Now they become a prospect. You need to turn them into a client, meaning they've spent money with you, right? Once they've turned into a client, that's where we delight them. That's where you create raving fans so that the next person that they hear that has the same problem as them, they're going to refer to you. Uh, I think it was about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I can't remember. I had a couple, they were actually referred from another couple. So I'd worked with this other couple. They were having some relationship issues. And I'm not a relationship coach. It's, it's not where I prefer to coach. I don't market for any relationship coaching. But I coached this other couple. And sure enough, they referred this couple to me. I didn't even have to sell it to them. They asked me, hey, what, what's the coaching? I said, it's a thousand pounds for five sessions. And it was Monday through to Friday. That was it. Boom, done and dusted. Because the previous couple were delighted and they were raving fans, guess what? The new referrals that they send are so much more likely. In fact, you're around 98% more likely to close on a referral than a cold call. 
So you want referrals. You want to have raving fans. Okay, another important factor of maintaining an interactive connection and keeping it positive is to have excellent, efficient customer service. Be there. That doesn't mean you know, as soon as the email comes through that you have to reply email straight away, but be efficient, be effective. If I go onto somebody's website and I want to go and do a course with them and they don't email me back for the next week, well, then I'm kind of, you know, do I really want to spend my money with this company? I want to be working with somebody who wants to work with me. Right? So be effective, be efficient, be kind. And remember, the mediocre teacher tells, the good teacher explains, the superior teacher demonstrates, and the great teacher inspires. So how can you inspire your audience? What questions do you guys have about this? Who thinks that they can go and create a course? Just type in yes. Sandra, I think so. Sandra, I know you can. Tom already have just going live. Brilliant. Tom, yes, I know about that one. Yeah, great. Who thinks that they can't? Okay, about value and workload. Okay, I'll come back to that, uh, Adlin. Who thinks that they can't go and create a course? By the way, there's no judgment in here either, guys. So, uh, not me? Okay, cool. I can, with work involved? Yeah, sure. Guys, you know, the thing is, we don't know what we don't know, right? And it's actually not that difficult. What? But I can create a course, but I can't sell. Okay. You don't have to sell per se, right? I, I was in sales for what almost twenty years, and I said I never was a salesperson either. Yet I sold for twenty years. It, it's about offering a quality product to the right client in a way that they go. You know what? This is undeniable. I absolutely need to have this. I don't want to sell anybody anything because I don't want people to have buyer's remorse. I want people to come to me and say, you know, I really want that because it seems like that's going to meet my needs. And so by becoming clear on exactly what that is that your client wants and, and, and finding what is that niche that they need filled, right? What's that, that uh, solution that they need an answer to? Like I said, this whole idea of the, uh, of the live training is really just about creating your intellectual property. Because what we can go and do now from this is break it up into a number of other ways. And let me just answer uh, Adlin's question. So uh, your question was, what was the difference between increase work, don't increase workload, uh, but increase value? I think the example I gave with that is if I consider in the seven day NLP training, there's so much information that we share already, right? Maybe some people, A, they would like some more information or maybe they don't have, uh, they didn't actually get it, right? So they need some additional time. They need some more of my time. As let's say we are in the UK and we finish at five o'clock, but that particular student still needs another hour or so. They need us to go through that information again for them to get that. Well, then rather than increasing my workload, I want to add value, right? I want to, see, to give them the resources to be able to do that. So the online videos uh, is an example of giving more value. I think I mentioned to you, Nobody else gives you videos. That is an example of adding value. That's an example of me not needing to re-explain a number of times because they can go and watch the video in their own time, in their own place, look at the demonstrations, etc. Make sense, Adlin? 